New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. Dr. Gupta is a recipient of Discovery Early Career Award by Australian Research Council. His research area emphasis self-healing concrete, carbon sequestration and utilization, bio-based building materials, and additive manufacturing. Dr. Gupta has authored 30-plus peer-reviewed Q1 international journal articles and more than 15 technical papers in the conference proceedings, book chapters, and a patent application too. So with this brief introduction, I request uh, uh, Dr. Saurabhdeep Gupta to deliver his speech. The title of the talk is Carbon Sequestration and Utilization in Portland Cement Concrete, a Pathway for Low Embodied Carbon Building Materials. Okay, um, a very good afternoon uh, to you all and thank you Professor Das for inviting and giving me this opportunity and a big shout out to the organizing team for making um, such nice arrangements. So today my talk will focus on carbon sequestration and utilization in cement-based materials. This is an emerging area because every country is trying to decarbonize their economy and construction infrastructure forms a large part of uh, activities. So if we look at the global scenario, we'll see that in terms of total CO2 emission, India is somewhere here, which is far below China. In fact, if we normalize the total CO2 emission in terms of the GDP, $1,000 US dollars, we see that India is very close to the world average. In fact, much lower than Russia, US, and China as well. But is it a reason to be happy about? Certainly not, because two years ago, we made a very ambitious target that in next 40 to 50 years, we are going to reach net zero carbon economy, right? So we must strive towards making this very close to zero. And it takes a lot of effort because a lot of innovation has to come in to reach that goal. So if we look at um, cement sector, which is basically the most widely used uh, binder material for construction, India is actually the second largest manufacturer and user of Portland cement. And the usage of Portland cement in terms of million tons and the CO2 emission is going up almost exponentially for the last few decades, except the dip here, which was due to COVID. And you know, all construction activities slumped for a while. And we look at the CO2 emission from sectors, different sectors, and unfortunately it's not visible. This is energy, which forms about 72% of the total CO2 emission. And out of the 72%, about 50 to 16% comes from construction and infrastructure. Now, we can always say that we can always make a shift to biofuels, renewable fuels, to cut down on CO2 emission from cement manufacturing but you cannot get rid of the CO2 emission that comes out as a result of limestone calcination. That is the chemical part of the problem, right? And you always have this factor, 44 gram of CO2 emitted from 100 gram of limestone calcination. So what can we do about it? So there are several ways. Uh, some are very old, some are relatively new. So the oldest way is sequestration of carbon in geological deposits. So geological deposits actually means lakes, reservoirs, or even underground deposits, where you pump in CO2 at high pressure and you store it in the rocks. It is, well, uh, an established way, but there are certain hazards that come with it. Firstly, the lining material of these storage tanks or reservoirs may actually fracture or fail, leading to acidification of the nearby water bodies and soil. So it becomes a very big environmental hazard if not managed properly. And second, you can imagine the amount of land, the amount of infrastructure you need to set up this kind of um, geological uh, deposits. The second technology, and that is emerging fast, is direct air capture technology, where you have huge plants like this with fans, which draw out CO2 from, selectively draw out CO2 from air and store it in certain tanks. And that contains certain absorbent, for example, amine-based absorbent and so on, but this as well is highly energy intensive. And to capture um, one ton of CO2, you have to spend somewhere between 250 to 600 US dollars, depending on the concentration of CO2 in the air. And secondly, to capture one ton of CO2, you need about 100 meter cube of water. So it's also very resource intensive. 
the last way, and that is also very relevant in terms of developing low carbon materials, is if we can use the captured CO2 from plants and use it to cure concrete through a process called accelerated carbonation curing, or we can use or utilize the CO2 to develop new building products or better building products, right? And that is the idea that uh, today I'm going to talk about. So now if we look at this technology, there, are, there could be three means. One is pre-carbonation, that means when you mix your concrete during the mixing stage, you can inject CO2 and it forms limestone, calcium carbonate, and it remains in the system, right? The second one is during the curing of concrete. So that is called the accelerated carbonation, where you cure your concrete under a CO2-rich environment uh, at a particular concentration, and you can mimic how much CO2 concentration is there in the flue gas, and you can dose it accordingly. And finally, the natural carbonation, which is a very, very slow process, and it takes about 20, 25 years to carbonate even the top few mm of concrete. Now, let's not confuse this with the carbonation as a durability concern. That is a durability concern, but for reinforced concrete. So here we are talking about mainly non-reinforced building members, which also has a lot of applications in the infrastructure industry. So let's talk about what is pre-carbonation, how, how it is done, just a brief uh, you know, discussion. So you know that cement has clinkers, right? And it can be tricalcium silicate or dicalcium silicate. And these clinker compounds can react with CO2 that you are dosing into the mixer, and it forms these hydration products and limestone, that is calcium carbonate, right? So if you look at the surface of anhydrous tricalcium silicate, you can see a very smooth surface before hydration starts. When the hydration starts, there are deposits of very small needle-like CSA gel that forms on the surface. And when you dose CO2, the hydration is somewhat accelerated. And one of the reasons for that is the calcium carbonate serves as nucleation center for further growth of hydration product. And that can lead to some improvement in strength, 8 to 10% at the early stage. There is a company um, in Canada or US, uh, I don't remember, called Carbon Cure. Uh, they use this process uh, in their plant uh, just before casting the concrete in form work. But what is reported, that is as per their website, is they can store only about 0.05 to 1.5% CO2 by weight of cement. That is minuscule, right? So to produce one gram of cement, you are emitting close to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 gram of CO2, and you're only capturing 1.5%. So that's a very small number. And there are some drawbacks as well. So, you know, besides reduction, very small reduction in embodied carbon, you can also acidify the water. The pH can drop. And that can lead to other problems, for example, retarded hydration at later stage. The second problem is that when calcium carbonate is formed, it forms as a coating on the surface of the hydrating grains. And that can stop or retard hydration at later ages. So you have to keep on curing your concrete for longer time, uh, you know, so for better strength gain. The other technique which has found more applications or has drawn more attentions, at least, is that of accelerated carbonation curing. And that can be done during um, manufacturing of concrete, during the curing stage, or even during transport of concrete members from the manufacturing site, uh, manufacturing facility, uh, to the site, right? So because it's a very quick process, happens within four to six hours. But before we go into there, we need to understand how the hydration process, because the efficacy of this technique is dependent on the amount of carbonatable product or carbonatable hydration product that forms in the cement. So through isothermal calorimetry, we can determine what is the rate of hydration of cementitious materials. I think Professor Subramaniam has already mentioned the heat signature, right? So this is the heat signature. It goes up, this is the acceleratory phase, comes down, kind of stabilizes after 24 or 26 hours, and we start the acceleration here, accelerated carbonation here, right? And this process goes on for the next five to six hours, depending on how much CO2 you are using. And on the layer, on the clinker grains, a layer of hydration compound is formed. And this has two types of product. One is called the outer product, and one is the inner product, which is much more densified than the outer product. And we are, when you are talking about carbonation, CO2 basically reacts with this outer product and deposits the calcium carbonate on the clinker grains and in the surrounding of the clinker grains, right? And these two are the governing equations, mostly, whereby calcium hydroxide, which is a hydration compound, 
reacts with CO2 to form calcium carbonate. It can be of different polymorphs, for example, calcite, aragonite, or vatrite. Or it can react with calcium silicate hydrate to form similar compounds. But what we don't want is excessive carbonation of calcium silicate hydrate. Because what will happen is calcium silicate hydrate has this kind of structure. It mimics the structure of clay, but in a more haphazard manner. So when you are carbonating this structure excessively, you are removing the calcium ions from this structure. And therefore, decalcification happens, and there is a drastic loss in compressive strength um, even at early stage, right? So the process conditions need to be um, uh, fixed in a way as per the chemical composition of the cement, or even uh, depending on the diffusion or permeability uh, of cement, right? So now, um, based on this uh, theory, we tried out several ways of maximizing carbon sequestration in Portland cement materials. The first thing we tried out about two years ago was by using biochar, and biochar is basically a porous material that is derived from pyrolysis of biomass waste or agricultural residues, for example. So if you look under biochar, which is not processed under a microscope, you can see this kind of macropores on the surface. But this kind of macropores are really not suitable for use in concrete because that leads to drastic reduction in strength and durability. So we have to grind it to find particles, and some particles can be in the nano range as well. But let's not be tricked into thinking that these kind of particles are not porous. In fact, they are highly mesoporous, with most of the pores in the size range of less than 10 nanometer or 20 nanometer, which is ideal for CO2 adsorption. Why we use biochar is because of its affinity to adsorb CO2 and improve the um, you know, carbon sequestration potential in cement. So we characterized um, biochar by different means, and one of them is finding out what is the total surface area and what is the micropore volume, which is most active in um, absorbing carbon dioxide. So if you look at the total surface area, it's very high, it's 196 to 400 meters square per gram, depending on how we make it, that is why a range is given. But about 60 to 70 percent of this total surface area is contributed by the micro and mesopores, right? And the rest is the external surface area. So higher the mesoporosity, higher will be the amount of CO2 that can be absorbed. And well, the chemical composition is simple, it has mostly carbon, it can vary in the range of 70 to 90 percent and with some hydrogen and nitrogen because it is derived from um, biomass. And then the hypothesis was if we add biochar to make lightweight concrete of density of 1,000 to 1,500 kg per meter cube, can we create pore channels in a controlled manner through which CO2 can diffuse in and then get deposited in the pores and in the process densify the uh, microstructure? And it did work. In fact, we saw under microscope just after carbonation is a lot of these small crystals got deposited in the macro pores that was created by the foam that was added to make the lightweight concrete, right? So it provides you know, a feasible pathway to store CO2 uh, in, term, in, in the form of carbonate minerals, which is ambient under normal uh, temperature conditions. But what about the engineering properties? Well, we made blocks of three different densities, 1,150, 1,300, and 1,450 kg per meter cube, which is about 50% to 60, 65% of the normal mortar density. And we find that the total CO2 uptake can be as high as 31%, depending on the density, right? And the strength that we get varies in the range of 4 to 9 megapascal, which satisfies what is needed for making blocks for uh, building and other uh, infrastructure purposes. So now the second question is, since we're using a lot of supplementary materials in cement these days to cut down on the amount of cement, what is the effect of CO2 sequestration or CO2 uptake depending on what kind of uh, supplementary material uh, we use, right? So depending on how much we are diluting, how much cement we are replacing, it can have three different effects. The first is called the dilution effect, whereby the net permeability increases because you are increasing the water to cement ratio by cutting down on the amount of cement, and it creates pathways for CO2 diffusion. Secondly, the calcium hydroxide may be converted to calcium silicate hydrate through pozzolanic reaction, and therefore some disbalance may happen because more CO2 uptake could be contributed by calcium silicate hydrate rather than calcium hydroxide. And finally, the hydration kinetics may be accelerated or delayed, and that can have effect on the diffusion of CO2. 
So with that in mind, uh, we tried out fly ash as a you know, possible, which is you know, one of the most common cement replacing materials. We replaced 20% of fly ash, and we combined that with biochar as well. And we found that the net CO2 uptake actually goes up when we have biochar in the system, and when you also have combination of fly ash and biochar in the system. And after this, we measured the strength at seven days and 28 days, and we see that the strength improvement is also very evident, which is of the order of 15 to 20% compared to control. What was very interesting is that if you take control and you spray phenolphthalein to find out the carbonation depth, in case of control, it's only about three to four millimeter from the edge of the specimen. When we have higher dilution, that means more fly ash, then the CO2 diffusion increases, and therefore you have higher carbonation depth, which actually means you can store higher volume of CO2 in the form of carbonate minerals in this kind of um, uh, mix. Right. So in terms of embodied carbon, if you combine uh, you know, how much CO2 reduction you have from replacing cement and how much CO2 storage can be facilitated, about 20 to 25% of embodied carbon can be reduced depending on the kind of supplementary admixture that you are using. The last part uh, of my talk, I'll be talking about CO2 utilization, right? So one part of the problem is how we can store it without um, hampering the engineering properties, mechanical and durability properties. The second thing, can we use CO2 to make a better material for construction? And one of the materials, um, or one of the wastes uh, that are generated in high number, huge number, is construction and demolition waste. And if you look at the Indian construction industry, about 30 to 35 percent of this construction waste comes from brick waste. So we have about, uh, as per statistics, 30 to 50 million pieces of brick waste being discarded, and you multiply it by the number, uh, by the weight of each brick, it could be of the order of uh, 100 million tons or uh, so, right? And only about one to two percent of these wastes are now uh, recycled. Um, brick waste, as such, can be used as um, as fine aggregate. Uh, or even coarse aggregate, but what happens is that the interfacial zone that is created around this uh, brick powder is very poor compared to the bulk matrix, so that is detrimental to the engineering properties, right? So now can we use CO2 to make it better and then utilize it as fine aggregates? So with that uh, in mind, uh, we developed a process. There are certain process conditions. So we have the brick powder, we sieve it, we have the sieve size analysis which closely confirms to uh, the M sand that we get in Bangalore. Uh, and then we treat it with CO2 under a certain process condition and flow rate, right? And then we replace sand, M sand, um, at 25% and 75% by mass. So if you now look at the chemical composition of this brick powder, uh, which was determined using X-ray fluorescence, XRF, uh, it is you know, a typically aluminosilicate material, which is a silica of about 55%, some calcium, uh, alumina and so on, and no heavy metal was detected in it, which can be considered environmentally safe. Now we did ACM and EDEX analysis to find out if there is any change in carbon content of the brick powder after carbonation treatment. And we did find a statistically significant amount of carbon is present in that brick powder, which is shown here. Normal brick powder doesn't have any carbon. It's almost gone because it is fired at around 800 degrees to 1,000 degrees. But when we carbonate, there is about 5 to 6% of C that we can find, and other compounds that remain almost unchanged with some reduction in calcium. So then we uh, used X-ray uh, diffractogram to find out is, is there any kind of structural change that is happening due to carbonation of brick powder. And we do see some changes. For example, if you compare this, which is carbonated brick powder and normal brick powder, some peaks which are associated with aragonite, which is a polymorph of calcium carbonate, has actually gone up after carbonation compared to the as-received powder. And when we zoom down into certain two theta ranges, we see that there is a change in the vaterite peak as well. So here, there is a single peak, and here you can see a double peak, and one of the peaks is associated with vaterite, which is also a polymorph of calcium carbonate. Plus, there are other minerals, for example, olastonite and anorthite, which are basically calcium silicate or aluminosilicate, which can react with CO2 to form calcium carbonate and alumina gel, right? And that can also be vi uh, visualized from XRD, where you see a difference in the peak structure turning from very crystalline to a more amorphous kind of response. And we did nitrogen adsorption on both types of brick powder, and we see that some improve, some enhancement in surface areas happened, not too much, but in terms of the 
uh, micropore volume and the median porosity that has reduced by almost about, I would say, 20, 25 percent after carbonation, which could happen due to deposition of this calcium carbonate microcrystal on the pores of brick powder. Now, with that, can we change the reactivity of the brick powder? And calorimetry, again, is a very good method that doesn't give you the total pozzolanic reaction, but the relative pozzolanic action of a material uh, if, you ha if you want to compare it with a more established material. And we compared that with that of M sand, fly ash, and non-carbonated brick powder. We added about 0 0.8 molar KOH as an activator because it doesn't react with water, some lime, so that the reaction can happen and we can get substantial heat signature out of it. And then we compared what is the total amount of heat that is generated as a result of this change in reactivity. And we see that, you know, in 12 hours from start from the addition of the solution, carbonated brick powder shows much higher heat release compared to um, non-treated uh, brick powder. Sand is somewhere here. Sand is mostly inert. But due to the presence of KOH, some silica can be etched and can go into dissolution and react. Right. So in terms of strength, in terms of 28-day strength, uh, we saw quite a bit of uh, difference, quite a bit of improvement after carbonation. Because if you look at um, you know, untreated brick powder, 25% replacement and 75% replacement of sand, there is a reduction in compressive strength by almost 20% compared to control, right? So the green bar that you see here is after steam curing, and the uh, grayish bar you see is after normal curing. So for both these curing conditions, there is a reduction in strength. But now after carbonation, what happens is that for both the curing conditions we see almost 20 to 21 percent of compressive strength improvement. And that is actually attributed to the pozzolanic action that it has at later stage, because at early stage we did not see much of the strength improvement taking place. In terms of shrinkage, uh, we also observed quite a bit of difference. We carbonated the um, you know, mortar containing brick powder, uh, both with carbonated and non-carbonated brick powder. And due to carbonation, about 17 percent reduction in shrinkage took place after 60 days. And this reduction brought us very close to the shrinkage of the control samples. That means the difference that you had uh, with the control has been mitigated due to this carbonation treatment. But that we found is only valid for 25% replacement of sand. When we have higher replacement, about 75%, we could not mitigate that difference. It's still higher compared to control. But due to carbonation, there is indeed a reduction in total shrinkage after 60 days. Right? And why that happens? Well, again, we uh, did some X-ray investigations and microstructure investigation using ACM. What we see under ACM is that the 25% uh, RBP non-carbonated contains a lot of ettringite, you know, around the brick powder crystals or in general in the bulk matrix. But when we carbonate it, we don't see or find much of ettringite precipitate. Instead, we see some small crystals, about two to three micron of size, of calcium carbonate being deposited. So what our belief is, and it is still undergoing um, you know, further investigation, is that due to the penetration of CO2, the ettringite can react with that, form alumina gel, alu aluminum hydroxide, calcium carbonate, and other compounds. And that's why we do not see much of ettringite. And due to conversion of ettringite to calcium carbonate, densification of the pore system happens, and that leads to reduction in shrinkage and improvement in compressive strength. And from XRD also, of course, we see that there is some ettringite peak for non-carbonated brick powder sample, but in case of carbonated, uh, we see you know, high peaks for intense peaks for calcium carbonate, but no visual peak uh, for ettringite. So that might be the possible reason. So now the question again comes back to you know, if carbon sequestration is a viable pathway, uh, why the development is slow, at least in India? And a survey was carried out about eight to nine years ago uh, in the US and about 230 experts in this area gave their votes. And the top three or four reasons were identified. The first one is, of course, the cost, because you need to set up a plant to process, capture the CO2, process it, and develop a curing facility for that. Uh, second is, where is the financial incentive? You have to incentivize the guys who are doing it, because without that, they can always say, you know, I am replacing 50% of cement by slag or 60% of cement. I don't want to venture into this new area, although we can capture more carbon dioxide, right? So it has to be incentivized. 
uh, or even penalized. Because now if you see the European market, they have this carbon trading uh, coming into force very rapidly. Even in California, they have this system uh, where industries can be penalized to some extent for higher emission. Or they can also trade the carbon that they save uh, you know, for other processes. And another is a catch-22 situation. You know, it's kind of a chicken-egg thing. Uh, which comes first, right? A demand or um, you know, increase in activity in this area, right? So there should be a pool mechanism, uh, you know, to create demand, to create, uh, you know, new incentives for the industry to adopt it. And finally, the liability. Companies can always say that, well, it works for maybe five years, 10 years, but due to change in policy, maybe my plant won't be working after 10 years or 15 years, maybe due to change in political landscape or so on. So there should be a shared liability uh, between you know, the authorities and the private sector to make it work, right? At least some assurance must be there, right? So with that, uh, I'll stop here. Um, so if, if, if there, there is any question, I'll be happy to answer it. Hello, sir. Uh, can you give some light on the uh, words activated carbon or porous carbon? Right. Yeah. Um, so if you look at um, non-activated carbon, you have to first understand that, right? So non-activated carbon is when you pyrolyze or gasify biomass, you get this char, which is black in color, and it has some porosity. And that porosity is very hierarchical. It means that there are macropores which connect to mesopores, mesopores connect to micropores, right? But often what happens is that due to tart deposition or due to um, you know, ununiform distribution of heat, some of the pore channels are not open. So what activation does, it increases the porosity. So for example, if you are doing steam activation or KOH activation, it will remove the volatiles, it will remove the deposit from the pores and create new pore channels for more diffusion of gases or any fluid that you want to filter. So it is beneficial to use activated carbon for the increased strength in various materials? It depends. So there should be a balance between the cost, the energy that goes in to make it, because of course you activate it, there is an energy price, right? And what benefit you are getting out of it, right? At least for us, we did not see substantially higher strength coming from activated carbon, right? We can still stick to, uh, you know, thermal treatment rather by optimizing the temperature and heating rate to create the right amount of porosity that we need. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session for us. Uh, now we have reached end of uh, today's keynote addresses. Before we finalize, I request uh, Professor uh, Kata, sir, uh, please come on the dais and uh, present memento to our speaker. Thank you, sir. Uh, dear participants, we have reached the end of keynote sessions for today.